Well, I think we grow up um, thinking we have to do one thing for the rest of our lives, right? What, what am I called to? What's my calling? And we hear that a lot in the faith space too, but also, um, you know, in the mainstream space, what's your name? What do you do? And we place so much emphasis on what we do and place so much of our identity into that as well. And, um, you know, one thing that I learned after getting called out in 2018, when I stepped away from those prestigious positions and couldn't identify myself as, hi, I'm Paula, I'm the anchor of GMA and Coast of the View, God really revealed to me that he's going to call me, he's going to call us to different things in different seasons. So I can't hold tight to it. And that's not my identity. And I have to remember what I'm doing and who I'm doing it for, right? I just say, give yourself permission to try new things in new seasons. Your value is not your vocation. Um, Look at your life as chapters and seasons instead of, I got to figure it all out. I got to figure out the next 20 years. No, what is, what are you being called to in this season? Hey everybody, Dr. Josh Axe here. Welcome to Growth Lab Podcast, where each and every week we cover the science behind how to grow yourself, your health, your wealth, and take your career, your relationships, and your spiritual wellness to the next level. This week we have Paula Ferris with us today. She is a she was a co-host of The View. She is a best-selling author of a book called How to Carry It All, Ditch the Mom Guilt, and Find a Better Way Forward, which I'm excited to talk about today. And she's she's been a person also who uh, I've admired, who just being very outspoken and very authentic about her faith, her mindset about being a mom and a woman who has had an extremely successful career. And before the interview started, I'm not going to hold this against her. I found out she's a big Michigan fan and I'm an Ohio State <laughs> fan, but we'll, we've already gotten past that point. And uh, I want to say, hey, Paula, we're, we're so excited to, to chat with you today. But have we gotten past that point? Dr. Josh, have we no, really? We, we may never, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll we can be friends, and, but we will be sworn enemies that one Saturday every November, which is that, when Ohio that, State and Michigan play. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. Well, I'm excited to talk today because, you know, I, I think one of the things that I've seen that, uh, I, I get questions about sometimes, but I know I grew up with this, is that how do you thrive as a mom and somebody who is also in the workplace, right? And I think those are two mm. roles that I think many people would agree that could be full-time both, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was doing some uh, some research on this recently, and they said, if we were to pay full-time mom, a stay-at-home mom, a full-time salary, the salary would be $184,000 a year because it's not a 40 hour week job. It's a, no, it's they, not. They, they, they give it a 96 hour uh, plus job and all the different things that went along with it. And so really there's a lot that you juggle. And so I, I, that's one of the things, maybe just even starting off, I'd love to sure. ask you about is how do you thrive in both of those roles successfully? And, and maybe there's more than both. It's also being a, you know a wife and there's other things that you've got maybe uh, involvement outside of that. Yeah. And it's, it, you brought up the book, you don't have to carry it all, ditch the mom guilt and find a better way forward. And I think, you know, Dr. Josh, I've done a lot of research in this particular area with the book, um, interviewing renowned experts and historians and sociologists about why it's so hard to be a working mom, a mother here in America. And um, nowhere but really here in the U.S. of A, do, do women have to choose between kids and a career? Um, it's there's very much an expectation in this country that you have to carry it all. You have to do it all. Um, and you can't ask for help. Or if you do, that's a weakness or you're a failure. And I think that's why so many moms are burnt out because we're juggling so much. We're carrying the weight of our family and responsibilities at home and work. And it's why our mental health is suffering. It's why our physical health is suffering, because we're trying to carry this unnecessary, this this large load that we were never meant to carry on our own. And look, being a, being a mother, uh, working, um, I work because I not only have to, uh, to help support my family, but I work because I really love the work that I get to do. And right now I'm 
advocating for working moms, making sure that being a working mom works, that motherhood is celebrated. But um, yeah, how do you do them both? It's hard. You hear, you've probably heard that saying, you can have it all, not at the same time. That's really an American thing. Like in other countries, women have no choice but to work. They take a great amount of pride in working and helping to contribute financially to the home. And they don't suffer from mom guilt because on the other side of that, Josh, not only do they have to work, um, there's a there's a great amount of support from the from society, from the the perception and attitudes um, of their particular country, the policymakers. It, it, here in America, it's your kid, your problem, your family, your problem. It's very, very individualized. In other countries, they're their brother's keeper. So there isn't this guilt about working because not only do they have to work, um, they take pride in it, but there's a lot of support on the other side of it. And kids aren't seen as a valueless commodity like they are here in America. But the way that the best advice that I have ever received is um, from a friend of mine. And, you know, I... I truly believe we don't have to carry it all. We try to, but it's not good for our health. (laughs) Um, But she said, Paula, the best thing you can do is go into each day knowing that you are going to drop a ball or two or three. And I go into each day knowing I'm going to drop drop a ball or two. I'm probably going to drop some balls. okay? (laughs) but I'm going to keep the glass balls in the air. The plastic ones, they can drop because plastic bounces. So what that has allowed me to do, Dr. Josh, is just accept my imperfection as a mother, as a wife, as a worker, as a human being, accept my imperfection every single day, and also to prioritize what really matters. Because is it like, yeah, if I drop that plastic ball, it's not going to be the end of the world. But if I drop that glass ball, things will shatter. So I drop the perfectionism. And I also um, am able to prioritize what's really important. And I give myself a lot of grace because I'm human and I'm not trying to carry it all anymore because I tried that for years, Dr. Josh. And I had an identity crisis. I have had ongoing health issues. Um, It's just not good for our overall well-being to try to carry it all and to try to do it all as parents, as wives, as mothers, as workers. Well, I think what you're heading on here is it's it's a it's a deeper issue. You've used the word identity quite quite often, mm-hmm. and I think that you know I, I think when we think about more of Western society today, and I, I've done a lot of a lot of research and study behind this in terms of having more of an Eastern, even Hebraic mindset, or more of our kind of uh, you know Western mindset around individualism. And so it is this idea of we've got to be the hero, we've got to carry it all ourselves. That you've been sharing. Versus, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back even to the Bible where it talks about when you get married, you know, you're you're sort of adding on to your in-laws' house, right? Uh-huh. I mean, it's, yes. it, it, there was there was a lot more of that familial support, the interdependency I, I, for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's that's something we've we've really lost, especially over the last you know fifty, a hundred years, is is that you know a lot of times we don't live close to our relatives or our family and we go to a place and we kind of get you know just completely isolated even from our community and i know for myself we have a we have a chelsea and i have a three and a half year old another one that's coming any day now and um and we rely so much on our our, my my in-laws i mean they Mm -hmm. are just there like like i i i i i told them even to my my sister and brother on my law. I'm like, I call dibs. Like, you know, and, and I, I would love my, my in-laws. Like we will build a house, you know, right next door to them because we just, uh, we rely on them so much. And that's just allowed us to have so much freedom, so much more ease and less stress in life. And, you know, not everyone has that exact, uh, maybe not everybody has their parents around or, or grew up with supportive parents and they may not have that support, but either way, we should still go and build community. Talk about that a little bit yeah, in terms sure. of even your own life. How have you guys gone and created this? Is it with family? Is it with other people? Like mm-hmm. how, how have you created that 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 network of support? Yeah, your friends can become your family. Um, so we, my husband and I are both from the Midwest. He's from Indiana and I'm from Michigan. We were college sweethearts. We met in Ohio at a small Christian school. We've been Which together you go to? Cedarville University near oh, Dayton. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. mean, I used to go to I used to go to basketball camp there because I grew up in Dayton. So I've, I've no been there. That's a way. great, great school. You went school. to basketball camp. I wonder oh, yeah. if you've I've got to ask my husband about you. So my husband played college basketball at Cedarville and was a college basketball All-American. But um, all that to say, like we 
we lived in Ohio um, for 12 years. We lived in Chicago. We lived in New York. We were moving around for work, mainly my work, because in in television, in the world of television news, it's like coaching. You have to take the the smaller job and then move up to junior high and coaching high yep. school and coaching college. And so for me, it was like working in different markets. That's why I worked in Dayton, Ohio, and Cincinnati, Ohio, and then Chicago, and then New York. Um, and we never had family very close to us. I mean, I I left home in 1997 when I graduated high school, and I never went back to Jackson, Michigan, where I was born and raised, to live full time. And so we've always had to create this community. But uh, Dr. Josh, in all honesty, it took me a long time to really ask for help. Uh, I would say in the last couple mm. of years, and I'm 48, so like the majority of my time as a mother um, and as a and as a woman, I had this mantra where I've got to do it all, I've got to carry it all, I can't ask for help. It's almost like we wear this this badge of honor as a as a mommy martyr or just a martyr. Like, no, I can do it myself. You know better than anyone else. That is not good for your well being, and yeah. it's not how we were created. Um, you know, you mentioned the beautiful interdependency. Um, that we have gotten so far away from where family members would live with you. And there's just this beautiful structure where you have people helping to raise your children. It's not just on you to raise your kids. And we've gotten so far away from that. In other countries, you know, they have the family member living with them. They have community that surrounds them and supports them. They are their brother's keeper. I saw this firsthand. My, my father's from Lebanon in the Middle East, and um, he passed away in 2019. And as, as we paid homage to my dad and we went back to the homeland there are 12 of us okay so as my siblings my three siblings are four of us total and then eight of my first cousins dr josh and we went back to the homeland to go see our family we still have a lot of family in lebanon and it 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 my uh, jidu and my situ my grand that's arabic for grandfather and grandmother were from this small mountain village called kaituli and I was so struck by the structures. Okay, they don't have a lot. They have apartments, but on the apartments aren't like finished on the top. They you see on the four corners, they still have these steel beams, posts almost waiting for the next family member to move in on top. So it was like, you know, the, it was my auntie and then her sister on top of her and then her kids on top of her. Like, there's just this beautiful interdependence where they're tight knit. They rely on one another. They're not a burden. They ask for help. There's almost um, an, a frustration and anger if you don't ask for help, if you don't rely. So it's like, how did we get so far away from that where we don't ask for help, where we feel like we're a failure or we're weak if we're asking for help. And it's just, I realized it's not good for our, my emotional, mental, physical well-being. And it's not how we were created to live. So um, creating the community, creating the, the, the family that you may not have close by, um, you know, recently... Like I said, I didn't do that very well. I wore that mommy martyr badge for so long. But now just creating that family, uh, the family, the friends who become family that that you want um, has been instrumental. And, you know, we have young people in our kids' lives that can speak life into them, you know, 20, 21 year olds. You know, I have friends that speak life into my kids that take care of my kids and help to mm. raise my kids, um, whether they're from our church or our small group or from the many different um, sports organizations that, that we're a part of. And a lot of people are like, I don't have that. Well, create it. You have it's That's Don't right. wait for it to come to you. I realized I have to be that to somebody else. So calling a friend up, hey, I'm going to take your kid for the week, kids for the weekend, go enjoy, you know, go enjoy a weekend away. Or I'm going to just proactively tell my friend, I'll pick your son up or your daughter up from, from practice and take them home for you. Like, be that help to somebody else. Break down those that stigma and those barriers of asking for help and be that community, be that change that you want. And you'll notice that you're going to start to form that community that you rely on one another. Like I need to rely on someone that is not a sign of weakness. It's not failure. And I've had to get over it because our society says something different. Yeah, I think there's so much wisdom there. And this is what I saw with, this is something that my mom did growing up and I was really blessed to have a mom who was, I think, conscious of so much of what you're sharing. And so my mom, it really, it's the two things you mentioned. It was, we had our church 
And mm-hmm. so there were, you know, like, you know, carpooling and, and that and then over time just sort of created a, you know, I would go over to a friend's house or we'd watch their kids even overnight and those sort of things. So we started doing that via our uh, via our church. And also I went to a, a Christian school when I was younger, not through high school, but just through elementary school, but developed those relationships and sports was that other area. But there definitely is a level of having to pursue those relationships and get involved a little bit, you know, and staying after mm-hmm. church or inviting those people over and, and interacting in that way. So I love that you shared that because I think that that's something a lot of people, um, you know, might, might, you know, might, might make an excuse about saying, well, I don't have that. And as you said, you've got to go and create that community. You know, there's a, yeah. there's a principle that I love and I know you've heard it too. And I think Jim Rohn said this, but there's also a law called Dunbar's law about it. And that's, you become like the people you spend the most time with. Mm-hmm. And the same goes for your kids, you know, growing up, I think my parents, I, I used to think my parents were just so, you know, stiff and they, they were really conscious <laughs> about who I spent time with, Yeah, yeah. you know, and looking back, mm-hmm. I'm like, I am so, so grateful now that I had those parents who drew those back boundaries and who were mm-hmm. saying, I want you spending time with this person. Hey, I want you to be careful with this person. I mean, just very, they were very aware of that. Yes. You know, there's a study that came out recently with some of that. Well, well, this is, I think this is related is there's a study that came out recently about daycare and how, um, how bad daycare can be for kids development. In fact, there's a much, much higher rate of ADHD in kids that are are in daycare and also um, emotional issues as well, mental health issues. And so, mm-hmm. you know, part of that is due to, well, who are the kids hanging out with when they're three years old? A lot of other chaotic three-year-olds and they can't go over to their mom or even the 21-year-old or whatever and, and kind of like get rebalanced, get reaffirmed, get loved for a second, and then go back out like they would at a, if they're at, at their parent with a playground. What are your thoughts on that? And is yes. that something? And by the way, and I say when I say this too, it's not to make anyone feel guilty about putting sure. their kids in daycare, but I always want to share the reality of these are several studies coming out and showing yeah. that it, it's you know it's 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 not 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 as healthy as as maybe some other scenarios for for kids. Yeah, and that's why I think that there should be an emphasis on not just affordable childcare, but quality childcare mm, in this country. Yeah. And I mean, the reality is, I, you know, I think I had a lot of blind spots for a long time, Josh. And I was like, yeah, if you and it was also the way I was raised. If you love your kids, you have to stay home and raise them. Right. It's not the reality for the majority of families in this country that we are dual income homes. We have a lot of single parents as well that are reliant on daycare yep. and reliant yep. on child care. And that's why I think if we really I just gave a talk on this to the Oklahoma Commission on the Status of Women and the child care crisis. I think if we really want to um, support women in the workforce, if we want to break down and make sure that there's gender equality, if we want to grow our economy, and if we want to make sure families are healthy, we need to invest in childcare and quality and affordable childcare. And um, I gave this talk and I, I made a case for why quality and affordable childcare are necessary. A, necessary for a healthy economy, because Dr. Josh, if we don't have children, it doesn't take a doctor, a scientist, an astrophysicist yeah, to figure out we don't have a human race. I talked no. to one of the most renowned uh, global economists. His name is um, Dr. Muhammad al Adian, and he's like he's like E.F. Hutton. When he talks, people listen. He's the E.F. Hutton of the financial um, and economic space. And he said, if we don't support families, if we continue to make it harder on families to have children, we'll have fewer kids, which means we will have a diminished labor force down the road. And if we have a small labor force, we can't grow our economy. So... You've seen this in um, in China, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, where these low birth rates. And by the way, we are we have record low birth rates. But, you know, juxtapose that with Americans still want to have kids. They still want to have more kids, but it's just so hard to have kids. It's a, there's a stress and a strain. So um, you look at these countries in Asia where they're pouring billions into the economy and billions to reverse the low birth rates, those trends, because they're realizing, oh, my word, if we continue to make it harder on families to have children, we can't grow our economy. 
So it's good for our economy. It's it's good for healthy families. Um, only in America do we have something called the happy gap where, where parents are disproportionately less happy than non-parents. <laughs> and it's very much an American phenomenon that's traced back to the stress and strain of having children. Um, it's very privatized to have kids in this country. It's uh, totally on you, yet society, what society reaps the benefits of our investment into our children. And also for gender equality, you know, like um, the lack of quality and affordable child care, Dr. Josh, is the number one barrier to women in the workforce. And it's not the 1950s anymore. It just isn't. You can't get by with one income. More families work because they have to. And if we continue to pay mothers less than their worth, and there is the such thing, uh, it's called the motherhood penalty, where we're paid less, we're valued less and scrutinized more. Once we become mothers, it's like we're treated like this risk and liability. If we're continued to pay to be paid less and valued less and the motherhood penalty continues, those cycles of debt and poverty will continue. So for me, like child care, I learned is kind of like you check three boxes by investing into our children, by investing in families. Those three boxes are we have a healthy economy if we have quality and affordable child care. We have healthy families if we have qu a quality, affordable child care. And we have gender equality if we have quality and affordable child care. It's not just like the nice thing to do. It's mission critical for families, for our economy, and for gender equality. It really is. So so, so, who, so a, a few questions related to this and not to get uh, no, let's into go. I love you, it. You know, politics and policies, but trying to understand here. So, so whose responsibility... Is it financially to sure. to 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 take care of, um, you know, to take care of kids? And my second part question is, what does quality look like? Give me a very exact description of how many, you know, teacher or or you know, care workers for a parent, or, or is that even what it is? It just walk, walk me through a, yeah. a little bit of this. Well, I think okay, to answer the first part of that question. Um, exactly whose responsibility is it? Look, I don't think our federal government does anything efficiently. <laughs> so, but they did solve this problem back in World War II called the Lanham Act, where all of our men were at war. The women had to infiltrate the labor force to keep the economy going. And they quickly realized, hey, we got to figure something out. Who's going to take care of the kids? And within weeks, they had this, um, it was a federally funded universal child care system up and running. I do not think it, like, I do not think that we should look to the federal government to to create any sort of program because they're terribly inefficient and they can't grant anything. But I do think that it is up to the federal government to invest in families. I think if we really want yeah. to get traction, local state governments, but corporations, um, corporations need to step up because they need to realize mm -hmm. that yeah. not only are they going to get um not only are they going to invest in families and invest in our economy, they're going to get a real loyal employee because parents and the, the, I believe the modern workforce right now is like comprised 70 to 80 percent of parents. Parents are very loyal, productive and, and efficient in the workforce when they feel that they're well supported. And and this next generation of workers, Gen Z, overwhelmingly wants child care as their number one benefit over health benefits. I saw mm. this this was a study that came out not too long ago. It blew blew me away because this next generation wants something totally different than we had, Dr. Josh. I mean, you've seen the reports that millennial dads are spending three times more time with their kids than their dads did. You know, it used to be, oh, I never changed a yes, diaper yeah. and guys would brag about that. This next generation wants something totally different. And that's yeah. where corporate America needs to step up. But they're getting a great employee, you know, if you can offer a child care stipend or you can have on-site child care, but there's creative things that you could do that that um, I've learned in my research, too. Um, the African-American Breastfeeding um, Network out of Milwaukee, they're a nonprofit. They can't afford fancy, swanky benefits, but she lets her employees set their own hours and bring their bring their children to work. She measures the measurables. There's another company. It's an agency um, called Brains on Fire out of Greenville, South Carolina. They have a program called don't quote me on this. I think it's called Babies in Motion. And what it is, it's like a return to work after paternity leave or maternity leave program to help bridge that gap because it's so hard to leave your baby at home or at the daycare or with a nanny. Um, and so what this program does is it allows the parent to bring their infant uh, back to work 
okay, when they would return from paternity or maternity leave until the baby is able to walk and mobile. And what it does is it helps ease that tension of that back to work, um, uh, just stress and strain and agony that a parent feels when they have to go back to work. I still get hives thinking about returning to work, you know, after maternity leave. Um, but it also it creates a culture where everybody's invested in those kids. And we talk all the time about we've talked so much already in this conversation about interdependency and being my brother's keeper and investing in the next generation. So there's real creative ways that corporations can step up, but they need to listen to the people. The people wants this next generation wants something different. But also, like, you can do the right thing and support families, but it's also good for your bottom line because by implementing these family-friendly policies, you're going to get a real loyal, productive, and um, efficient worker. Like, they don't leave. Parents that feel taken care of and supported as not just a worker, but a parent, they are incredibly loyal. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the loyalty factor. I've also owned five businesses and... <laughs> you know, one that's over a hundred million, million, and and, and I, I do know there's also major challenges. Uh, there are to mm -hmm. to in, in in costs and things associated with trying to set something up. But I but I've also noticed, as you said, I think as, as I have you know Gen X or baby boomer workers that work for me, we we have. Um, I'm Gen know, X they, right they, here, they, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm 42. <laughs> um, and uh, and so you know so yeah I'm, I'm more of a Gen Xer and and I and I've seen too that you know the, 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 they care more about compensation I have seen millennials and Gen Z they care more about freedom mm -hmm. and lifestyle and mm -hmm. even culture at work and and all kind and, and and what you're talking about things like childcare and the benefits I mean that's something that's I think. They're definitely more aware. So I, but I, I do see the importance and I, and, and, I, and I do think for a lot of organizations, it's something they can really capitalize on. I mean, you know, if I ask my dad who worked on telephone lines and, you know, for a majority of his career in Ohio in the cold winters, like, hey, why did you choose to work here? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, his answer was, well, I, I, want, I want to provide for my family and security yes. and just, you know, this the things you know you'd hear. Uh -huh. If I ask someone else who, you know, anyone else, I'd be, you know, anyone else today, the answer is not, that's not the answer. If I ask a millennial mm -hmm. Gen Z, I mean, no. you're not going to hear something like that. It's a very, very different mentality. And I do think to your point, organizations need to um, be aware of that and provide that. Well, and, and I do have a few other, you, you know, I want to, I want to say, I, I do think the families that I see thrive the most though, I think there's an element of, I'm going to take, it's in, in, you said this to a degree. It's I'm going to take personal responsibility, though. I'm not going to put it on the government and say, hey, government or, or educational system or daycare. Here's my kid. Do a good job raising them because mm -hmm. that would just be the most naive thing of of all time. Right. There is a level of personal responsibility. Of, 100%, I yeah. know that I've got to do everything I can to get my child in a great situation. And before I go back to this, I do want to say I also think there's an element of materialism here. Because poverty levels, if you look at quality of living of somebody who is low income today, what somebody would live in versus if we go back 50 years, it's actually much higher. Right. And, yep. and, and, and so so I've definitely seen the data on the poverty and, and how actually. So so I, 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 I do want to point out that I think that some of it is our materialistic values and leaning more feminine as a culture compared mm -hmm. to more masculine in the past of of um feeling pressured or not feeling pressure or feeling what's praised today mm -hmm. um i think that you know the working mom or being the boss babe or whatever <laughs> i think that is a little bit more i'm just saying i think it's a little bit more praised today in what culture glorifies versus being a stay-at-home mom i mm -hmm. think is less glamorous today than maybe it was more praised 100 years ago so yeah. i think there's a lot of those cultural issues too I just wanted to mention too, and I think there is a level of, again, wanting to have more things because of culture says we should that maybe forces some women to do yeah. more more work than maybe in the past. I do agree with that to, to a point. But if you look at wages, the last 30, 40 years, they have been stagnant. 
And for instance, childcare costs have gone up so much. It now costs in 34 states, Dr. Josh, it costs more to send your kid to daycare or child care than it does to send your kid to college at an in-state college for a year, which just goes to show you like yeah, here's early, earnings have been stagnant and our expenses have just gone through the roof. And yes, there's something to be said for we want more. You know, there's definitely a materialistic angle to all of this. But if you go back in the history and look, I grew up in a very conservative Christian home, always lived with that tension of doesn't a real godly woman stay home and raise her kids. And so I realized though a lot of that is the generational weight and pressure that we're putting on ourselves and also how things have kind of been twisted to tell women where their roles are and where they belong in society and home and work. And so I really, and and you don't have to carry it all, uh, ditch the mom guilt and find a better way forward in my book. I I really dove into this from a historical perspective and from a from a biblical perspective. The historical perspective really kind of blew me out of the water because I thought, let's get back to that traditional nuclear family of the 50s and 60s, right? But that was actually the least traditional family that we had throughout American history. The most traditional family we had was the family that worked side by side. They co-labored, they co-produced, they parented together, they partnered. And it really wasn't until the 50s and 60s after the war where we started pushing men out of the home and we pushed women out of the workforce. And our message to men, we actually did a great disservice to men. We told them that your only job is to provide for this family. And if you can't, you're a failure. And we told women, Mm. if you have any ambition outside of the home, you're a menace. That that a working woman is is a disease. And so that was really, yes, we were trying to create and carve out yeah. these two roles, but it kind of backfired on us because that's when we started pushing the men out of the home, right? And we and you think about toxic masculinity and the messages that you have been raised with our very generational, Dr. Josh, that yeah. you're a failure if you can't provide for your family. It wasn't like that a couple hundred years ago. I mean, where they worked side by side and even women dating back to medieval times would call themselves resourceful and hardworking. It wasn't until really the 50s and 60s that we started describing ourselves as nurturing. So how much of the tension is because it's supposed to be this way and how much of it is, oh, we were just kind of raised with these generational norms and expectations? Well, 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 I think the biggest thing that's changed and it's something you you had pointed out there is, is that you're doing things together versus apart, right? I mean, yes. I think, you know, you look at the careers. I, I want to say that this is, a, this is a stat I saw years ago, 120 years ago, 40% of careers were uh, were, were related to agriculture. Yes. And so it's like, <laughs> you, know, the, the, uh-huh. you know, the, yeah, yeah ex- exactly. And so you, you, you see that, you know, uh, the boys were going out with the dad and learning how to do whatever the dad was doing. And the girls were going with the mom, learn how to, and then mm-hmm. there was also crossover with, with both. And so there was a lot more doing things as a unit. And today it's like, well, I'm going to drive here and I'm yeah. going to drive here and you're going to stay here and everybody is separate. And so I do think that, you know, when I think about the, one of the roots of the problem, it's something you shared. It's just, it's this level of separation that's taking place within the household. Um, yeah. That, that, that's important. And so, you know, so, so going back to this in, in your, if, if you're giving your prescription or your recommendation for what does a good daycare, or if, if it's mm-hmm. not daycare, you can call it something else. Right. But if you have that mom saying, I want to work and I want to provide, and you have the dad saying, I want to work and I want to provide what, what are the, and by the way, you can give a hierarchy of a ranking order if that's also best. What, what, what are some of the solutions in ranking order that's, that's the best for the kids? Yeah, I, and I do think, look, there's, you, you, and I apologize, I never got to point number two, the question that you, you had asked earlier about quality, what does quality yeah. um, and affordable child care look like. And I will say this as someone who never put, I never put my kid in child care and daycare because I couldn't. I w- working in TV. I was either working the overnight shift or I was working two to midnight, and it just wasn't feasible for my schedule. Often on the weekends when I anchored GMA, I had to leave at three in the morning, so I couldn't mm. put my kids in daycare because I didn't have a traditional nine to five job. All right, so just take that with a grain of salt. So we had a nanny or we had a full time babysitter. We eventually transitioned to uh, a program called an au pair program, where you have a foreign exchange student living with you. And oh, wow. um, and is a year a one year program. I I think yes, you cited that that study about kids and daycare, but you can easily find other research that says you know 
um, the children of working parents, like the sons turn out to be um, more supportive and uh, better partners and better, more involved fathers and the daughters of working moms turn out to be more confident and they command more money and they they rise in the ranks in the workforce. So like you can look at the other side of that coin too. And I don't want to demonize but, but, work. But, 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 but I do want to say, I think we're talking about two different things. Here. Yes. I, I, I agree, but I'm okay, just getting to okay, the root of okay. why we work yeah. and some of the tension that we feel with working. Um, but I think it, the way that we can get quality child care is we we need to hire people that have credentials. And this is not a it's not uncommon in other countries and whether they're they have teaching credentials or they've gone through some sort of certification program. Um, again, kids are our future. Are they not? And I think that's something we can all yeah. agree on. Kids are our greatest yeah. natural resource. We need to invest in the future. Quality, affordable childcare in other countries, like in Europe, they have what's called early. It's like an early education. It starts at ages two, like in France and the UK, and um, it's highly subsidized and it's look, looked at as schooling. So all the cognitive development isn't just on the parent and even stay at home. Parents send their kids to this early childhood development because it's seen as schooling and it's um, and it's subsidized. And so that early cognitive development is not just on the parent because that's a huge stress and strain that, oh, my gosh, everything I do for my kid is going to have to be privatized. So I think there are many more. There's a lot more that we can do here in America to make sure that the child care that we have isn't just affordable, but it is quality, because at the end of the day, these kids are our greatest natural resource. They are the future of their of our country. We need to invest in them. And the responsibility shouldn't just be on the parent to, quote unquote, raise the kid, because our entire society, Dr. Josh, is going to benefit from the investment into our children. Our kids will be part of the workforce one day that will help to grow our economy. And so this it, I do think that there is a level of um, I'm not saying government um, is responsible for all of it. But I do think that if we want to say that we're family first in this country, we need to step it up. And one way we can step up is through our social policies. Another way we can step it up is just our attitudes, our attitudes in this country about families and about kids. I can't tell you how many times with the yeah, child care like issue, the number one thing I hear, they're not my kids, so they're not my problem. That's mm -hmm. the number one pushback and retort that I hear in response to child care. And then I would say, well, they're actually it, it's actually good for the economy. It's good for healthy families and it's good for gender equality. So it's something that we can always should all agree on. Yeah, and, and and I'm I'm very much for well, I'm very much for less government, generally speaking, but I'm also very too. much for incentivizing good mm -hmm. behavior and things that are good for society as a whole, as you're yes. saying. And so I think your points here are incredibly valid and good. You know, I think one, one of the things that I saw as I was doing, uh, again, some of this research on as we looked at the uh, at daycare, you know, what, one of the one of the ideal factors is, is, you know, uh, having somebody that's credentialed and, mm -hmm. you know, less student per. So if you've got like 15 per one, that's not near as good as obviously one to seven, right? There, you know, sure. where a child's getting a lot more one on one interaction. And I do think, again, going back to this, so I think anything we can do to have family and friends just build community. I did mm -hmm. an interview yesterday uh, with, um, with, with somebody who is a researcher for 15 years. He was a research scientist for Gallup that does, you know, all the yep. polls Gallup and surveys. Polls, yes. and, mm -hmm. And, and so and this is what he's, he's looked at all the research his whole career. And he said for somebody to actually be truly fulfilled in their life and happy. I mean, the most important thing was community. I mean, it was I mean, it was sort of the anchor of all of this stuff. 100%. And so if you don't have it, it's it, everything suffers. You suffer. Your kids suffer. So that community right. component that you start off talking about is so important. You know, one of the things I know that you you um, I think referenced at one point was, you know, you had sort of a. Um, I think I'm going to call it a, you know, it, whether it's a crisis or a come to Jesus moment or something <laughs> like that sort of in your life with having uh -huh. all of these responsibilities yeah. and things going on. Well, th th share a little bit more about sort of that, you know, that, that, that experience and sort of and how you got to where, where you are now. Yeah. So I had um, back in 2018, like at the top of my broadcasting career, I pretty much had an identity crisis. I, well, first of all, I was burnt out. Um, as a as a working mom. And I felt like I got to the pinnacle. And, you know, it's like, what good is it to gain the world, but lose your soul in the process? And I felt a little bit like that. 
and mm-hmm. my choices weren't necessarily aligning, uh, you know, with my values. And so I really felt that I was supposed to step away at the height of my career, which sounded crazy, but I really felt like God was nudging me to just like trust him. And to like, I felt like he was calling me out of a season where I had become so addicted to the spotlight and the achievement and the accomplishment, which I think is, I had to learn there's nothing like, it's okay to love what you do, but don't be defined by it. And I realized after I walked away, I, I, so this was 2018 and and I went to my bosses at ABC and I said, I just can't do this anymore. I was working weird hours and I had Mondays and Tuesdays off. I was working every weekend, wasn't seeing my husband or kids. And, and so I just wanted to get my life back. I wanted to work Monday through Friday. And so I said, can I just be a general correspondent? So I went from Good Morning America co-anchor on the weekends to, and co-host of The View to general correspondent. That's like, that's like demoting yourself from head coach to like, you know, the quarterback's coach, you know, or like, you yeah, know, the grad assistant. Yeah. So, um, but I really felt like I was supposed to do that. And in that moment, I realized I had tied so much of my identity to what I did. And it was a real painful time for me because I was a little angry at God for, for first of all, calling me out and telling me I needed to step away from these positions. I was like, why would you lead me to this, to this, to the top only to have me walk away from it? And so I had to really like figure out who I was outside of what I did. Um, and the pendulum swung really far, you know, like the pendulum has swung real far for me, like as just an all in, you know, working mom to st- I've been a stay at home mom. And I feel like it's starting to find its equilibrium and balance right now. But I really had to learn that my identity shouldn't be in anything um, outside of, uh, you know, my faith in Jesus and whether that's motherhood. I think so many of, of us, we put so much of our identity into motherhood and being a mother and feeling needed. We have to feel needed. And then when the kids leave, we don't know who we are. Um, mm. And like my kids are my world, but they're not my identity. My job means so much to me. The work that I do for working moms means so much to me, but it's not my identity. And I think if we put our identity in anything that can change, we're bound to be rocked. So um, that was a lesson that I had to learn and then um, relearn when the pandemic hit because, you know, after I demoted myself about a little over a year later, um, my contract was up for renewal and ABC chose not to re-sign me and I had to figure out what was next. Um, you know, do I stay in TV um, which is kind of the safe choice. You know, it's what I'd been doing for over 20 years. It was the comfortable and expected choice. Or do I go for this thing over here? Because I long had it on my heart to advocate for mothers in the workspace and advocate for motherhood in general. I just didn't know what that was going to look like. And so um, I say, you know, sometimes we have to be pushed onto our path through pain. I never anticipated losing a job, but it forced me to figure it out, forced me to figure out those next steps. And so I decided to form Carrie. That was then the moment I decided I was like, God, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know that I really want to use my voice and be an advocate for motherhood to make sure that motherhood is celebrated instead of penalized and scrutinized in this country. I want to make sure that being a working mom works. I want to advocate for mothers in the workplace because I know too well what it feels like, what it's like to be Um, a mother and discriminated against because of that. I'm not, I'm not hired as often. I'm paid less. I'm passed over on promotions. I'm scrutinized because I'm a mom. When in reality, I mean, and you're, you understand the science, like there's a lot of science that happens to mothers from our capacity and efficiency um, and our empathy, all of those grow scientifically, even, even parents in general, we grow in a lot of capabilities because of parenthood, not in spite of, and so I just was like, okay, I, I just need to do something. I didn't know what it was going to look like, but I launched Carrie um, out of my home. And so, did, hey, hey, so, did, did I ask about yeah. what, 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 what is Carrie? Because I, I, obviously yeah. you've, you've mentioned it a couple of times. What, yeah. what, what, what is it exactly? So I founded Carrie, Carrie Media. It's like we want to help carry the burdens of working uh-huh. moms because they're carrying so much. And mm. so we provide low lessening content. We advocate for working moms through that content. We're also doing a lot in the B2B space, advocacy work, working with companies to make sure that mothers are hired and retained and supported. And, and we're um, we're trying to show that like if you want the top, a, a top notch employee, look no further than a mother or a parent. So we're really trying to do a lot of advocacy work in the B2B space that the consumer doesn't see. But, you know, forward facing, we provide load lessening content for working moms who are carrying so much. We want to help take a take the burden off of them. 
I love that. It's so powerful. Thank so you. powerful. You know, one of the things that I've heard from, because I've had this, I mean, now that I've got, you know, now that I have kids and, and we're being very conscious, first off, it's just crazy. I mean, like Chelsea and I are joking around, but we're not joking right now with another <laughs> baby on the way that it's, we're like, well, you know, as soon as, as soon as, you know, conception happens, we need to, you know, get them in line to get in the, you know, preschool we want them to get into because it's so hard in Nashville, so Tennessee competitive. now. I oh, mean, it's, it's so unbelievable. I'm like, I'm yeah. going through the most rigorous interview I've ever been through for, <laughs> you know, and references and everything else to see if we can get her into this. It's this, it's this Christian school we love and, uh, and the teachers are just so kind and so, yeah. and so great. But, you know, w- what are your thoughts right now on, um, and feel free to say anything, you know, uh, anything you want here, but what are your thoughts on right now in terms of like, now I think about now, you know, daycare is one thing and it's happening less often, but it's still happening there when we talk about values. Cause something I've heard you continually say, uh, at least, well, uh, several times you brought up the word values and mm-hmm. how values are mm-hmm. really important to you and your family. You've right. talked about them in relation to your faith. Talk, talk, talk to me about what, what, like, what are parents to do today when they look at sending their kids to a public school? By the way, so I went to a Christian school when I was younger, but then I went to a public school mm. um, just in, in Ohio. And it was, it was a very different culture. I mean, I went from teachers that, I mean, they really, like, it, 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 I don't want to say they didn't care in public, but they really care, like, more in private. Like, my teachers were like, again, it, it was just, they cared more. I'll just say that. Well, they cared also, more. the student teacher ratio was a lot was smaller like, too yes. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, you go that, to a small uh, christian you, school you, or a you're private you're absolutely school. you're absolutely right and that was there too but but the values are different today like when i went to school like they didn't have like gun detectors go like like there wasn't metal detectors like we didn't have that and then what the curriculum was now my parents complained about them teaching us certain things regarding evolution but outside of that it was like okay we're just not getting political in school Mm -hmm. well today it's very different what are your thoughts right now on the current educational system uh private versus public Mm -hmm. Uh, i know that this is a very broad question but what are parents to do if they're sort of asking that question of what do i do because obviously this one it's you know can be incredibly expensive to go to a private school Mm -hmm. What, what, what are your thoughts there Well, my kids are all in public schools, but public schools in the South are a lot different than the public schools in the Northeast where they were going. And I'm the actual inverse of you. I went to public schools until high school, and then I went to a small Christian school for high school. So I've seen all types of curriculum, and I've experienced it not just as a a student, but as a parent, too. And I think, like... I grew up in a very sheltered home. I mean, I remember I'm still scarred and traumatized, Josh, from getting removed from sex ed class in junior high at the public school. I remember kids coming up and mocking me and making fun of me. I mean, I couldn't go trick or treating um, on Halloween because it was the devil's holiday. And like we had to dress so (laughs) modestly. My parents were so strict. Um, I think, look, our kids are going to experience culture and experience the world Um, whether we want them to or not. And I think it's so important, whether your kids are in Christian schools or you choose to send them to public schools. I mean, you can, I know people on both sides of the debate. For me, I'm like, do what's best for your kid, okay? Um, Considering the, the, the school district and what you also, what you can afford, because it's easy to say, I'm gonna send my kid to a private school or a Christian school. Well, that's a choice, a financial choice that a lot of parents can't afford. Um, so I, I think the the greatest advice that I've gotten, and it's from Sissy Goff, who is based there in Nashville. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she just says, um, you know, whatever the conversation is, be very like make sure that your kids hear you in the conversation first instead of somebody else. And so I'm that. a big proponent of turning everything into a conversation. So, um, you know, if, if your kids are in public school and they're teaching a certain curriculum, talk about it with your kids, ask them what they think about it. And because they're going to hear this one way or another, they cannot live in a bubble and an echo chamber for their entire life. So arm them with what they need to know 
your kids need to be ready to explain for the hope that is within them, to be ready to explain what they believe and why they believe it. So use it as a conversation to talk about what you believe as a family, what you're going to be hearing and inundated um, from the world and why we believe what we believe um, instead of just removing them from the situation and not arming them and equipping them with with a retort or um, critical thinking, like they need to develop critical thinking skills too, because that's right. if you shelter your kids too much, and I say this as a kid who was pretty freaking sheltered growing up, you know, I was going to learn it one way or the other. I would have rather heard it from my parents. And now with my kids, even when it comes to the sex talk or anything, I want them to have my voice and my husband's voice in their head when they're thinking about it, not somebody else's. I want to be the one that talks to them about it. Talk. To, your kids are hearing so much um, and they can they can handle so much more than we think they can. Um, so don't be afraid to have those conversations with them. Um, and just keep it open-ended. Ask them their thoughts about it. They will kind of guide the conversation and stick to the facts. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is great advice. And by the way, I, I know so many people have gone to public schools, homeschool, yeah. and private, mm -hmm. yep. and, and, and Christian and Catholic and a number. And I've, and, and like anything, I, you know, I've, we, I've seen people from, you know, from, from, from private Christian go off and just do terrible things and people from public, I mean, it's, it, you know, just do some incredibly virtuous things. And part of it is because they got tested more yeah, uh, and went through more trials and tribulations in, you know, in the school they were in. And so, but, but, but I, I, I do, I do think that again, school is a little different today. And I do think oh, it that is absolutely. It's e e mm -hmm. even more consciously as yep. you were sharing, parents have to be involved. You, you, you can't leave teaching your kid up to the school or even the no. church alone. You, 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 you've got to be hands on. And this goes back to, I think, a, sort of a, a theme of our entire conversation is, is that is you can't be separate. Like families need to be no. doing these things, having these conversations together. And that's yep. that's the key across the board. And one thing I'll, t I'll suggest to you that has been suggested to me, and I have three children, or my husband and I have three children, and I have a 16-year-old daughter uh, who's in 10th grade and then I have an 8th grade son who's in uh who's 14 and then I have a 4th grade son so I have a, a who's at, who's 9 years old so three kids the one of the best things you can do for your kid is to make sure that there are other adults or teens uh you know if they're younger like somebody from a youth group or a mentor that they can they can the, who they respect right but it's not you because Josh you could tell them the same thing seven times seven different ways upside down they're going to hear it once from somebody else that's not you that they trust and they're gonna be like mom i can't believe what chelsea told me at youth group my youth group leader and i'm like I i've been telling you that for three months yeah make yeah. sure do your you do not have to carry it all as a parent make sure that there are people in their life that can speak life into them that will not be dismissive of your parenting um or a uh, diminishing of the way you're raising your kids but are actually helping to support and foster that growth we had a young um uh, a young man um, whom my husband coaches. So my husband co also coaches high school and youth basketball. And this kid graduated from high school a couple of years ago. And my husband and I just both happened to be out of town for work the same week. And so we hired this young man. He's in his early 20s to m watch our boys because my daughter, she's 16. She's like on her own. Um, she can do her own thing. But to watch our boys, pick them up from school, speak life into them. He's also a youth group leader. They worship this kid. Anything this and, and we know he's a good kid and he's not yeah. going to disrupt our parenting. He's not going to there's not going to be any conflict with our parenting. We know he's almost an extension of us. And so we're like, hey, Amari, can you tell the boys this? You know, can you encourage the boys in this way? Because coming from somebody that they love and respect as a mentor or another adult in their life. They're going to listen to that, but they won't necessarily listen to the parent. That's just how kids are. So find good people that that can help raise your kid, that can help speak life into them, right? Um, that's one of the greatest gifts that you can give yourself and your kids. I think it's incredible advice. And I look at my own upbringing. I was so blessed to have, we had this couple who actually one, uh, they played football in, at, at, in Kentucky and the other, his wife played basketball right. and they, they taught me how to, um, how to work out and be fit, but they also had a really, really high character taught me about sort of, uh, being an entrepreneur and a number of things too. And I was friends with them from, 
uh, throughout high school and college and beyond. And so that was something strategically I, I can look back on that my yep. parents did as well. And this goes back to this Dunbar law. Like we talked about the thing, like you become the five people you spend the most time with, but Dunbar's mm-hmm. law actually truly says, no, you just become like, it's not just the five people, there's other rungs. And so you become mm-hmm. most like your parents, but then those other people you spend time with and those other people, just those different rings of, of that kind of continue. So anyways, I, I think that's just a, that I'm going to take that to heart even more so now. <laughs> and I really appreciate that piece of advice. It's, it's all been really, advice. Really like the stuff awesome. that I'm sharing with you is what's been shared with me. <laughs> so it's tried and trusted. It's nothing original that I thought of. It was just great advice that was given to me that I've implemented and has like, it's gone a long way. That's so. awesome. You know, I had a few other questions I wanted to ask you before we go here. And, and one of those would be, you know, you've had such a successful career. You've interviewed some amazing people. I was going through a list here of, you know, uh, you know, Tiger Woods, Bob Iger, you know, the president, mm-hmm. like just a number. You, you've interviewed a lot of people. And have you ever had any moments in your career where you felt maybe a sense of self-doubt or imposter syndrome or anything like that that you felt like, hey, you know, uh, you know, um, I'm afraid of being exposed and just any sort of sure. self-doubt or imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome affects like the most successful people. It affects almost everyone who uh, who might be at the top of their game. I have felt unqualified on a number of occasions. I feel unqualified on a daily basis. I was actually just talking to a friend who is um, uh, she's a big name in the culinary space. She's like, I still feel unqualified every single day. And imposter syndrome hits hits the most successful. I remember um, when I worked at GMA and I was talking to Michael Strahan and George Stephanopoulos. And I was like, do you guys still get nervous like before the show? Because I know I do. And they're like, oh, yeah, I get nervous before interviews. And I think just normalizing that it's kind of normal to feel unqualified. The fear of it's so much of that is traced back to our fear of failure. We don't want to look like mm. a fraud. We don't want to fail. Yeah. But the fear of failure is so it's the that's the most common fear that we experience as humans and yet it can feel so isolating because we're like am i the only one here who feels like a fraud Mm -hmm. what's going to happen if people find out about me and it can be so isolating but in reality it's like there's a common denominator with almost all of us that we're all fearful of failing and we carry this feeling of being unqualified throughout our lives and it doesn't disappear, but I've just learned to accept that it's kind of normal. Everybody feels it yeah. and um, you just got to push into it. And I think, too, if you don't feel some sort of nerve or anxiety, especially in like a performance based business, um, then there's something wrong with you because you can channel it into adrenaline and energy. That's what I would do before right. big interviews or a show. I would just like learn to channel it and um yeah, I think there's something wrong with you if you don't feel those feelings. There really is. It's very normal. So don't feel like you're alone. Don't isolate yourself because it is the most common fear that we have as humans is that of failing and feeling like we're a fraud. That's so good. You know, one of the things I noticed, and I don't run my clinic anymore, but the first five, six years when I did, I, one of the things I think that I was most surprised by as a clinician is how many, my it was a family practice, I had a lot of young moms coming in. And, um, you know, when I would sit down with them and kind of go over their patient history or look through things, the the common thing was the number one thing I heard, and I just remember this kind of repeatedly in my head is, hey, how do you feel? What the word overwhelmed? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a word I was constantly hearing from moms. And I think there's a level of maybe feeling of falling short or, or not, not being able to do everything, right? Maybe a sense of even guilt with it. What is your advice for moms who are feeling like they are falling short, they're overwhelmed, mm-hmm. they're in that, 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 you know, that position? I think it goes back to that earlier conversation we were having um, earlier in, in the conversation where we were talking about trying to carry it all, trying to do it all. And this is this expectation that, That we have to do it all. We can't ask for help or we're weak or we're a failure. And it's just an unrealistic expectation. Um, However, we we applaud it. We applaud the mommy martyr status. We applaud the mom who is doing it all um, and has a smile on her face and has her hair done and lipstick on. You know, we applaud that. But it's not good for our health, our long term health, emotional, physical, um, spiritual, all of it. So I would just say, look, it's. It's normal that you would feel like that because that's 
what the expectation is in our society, but it's an unrealistic, unhealthy expectation to try to carry it all. And the first thing that you can do is decide that you're not going to carry it all anymore and ask for help and find your village and find your people where you can be raw and vulnerable. Ask for help. Drop those balls on a daily basis. Give yourself a lot of grace and just say, I'm not going to carry it all anymore because it is not good for me and I'm going to ask for help. That's great. It's so good. You know, one of the things I know you've been an ad- advocate for is living a called, uh, you know, living called is is one thing I know you've said, and that's pursuing purposeful work aligned with your mm-hmm. values. Mm-hmm. Talk to me a little bit about that living called. Yeah, I think, um, well, I think we grow up um, thinking we have to do one thing for the rest of our lives, right? What, what am I called to? What's my calling? And we hear that a lot yeah. in the faith space too, but also... Um, you know, in the mainstream space, what's your name? What do you do? And we place so much emphasis on what we do and place so much of our identity into that as well. And, um, you know, one thing that I learned after getting called out in 2018, when I stepped away from those prestigious positions and couldn't identify myself as, hi, I'm Paula. I'm the anchor of GMA and Coast of the View. Um, God really revealed to me that he's going to call me. He's going to call us to different things in different seasons. So I can't hold tight to it. And that's not my identity. And I have to remember what I'm doing and who I'm doing it for, right? So my gifts and talents may not change. My gifts and talents, and we all have unique talents and gifts. You know, your unique talents and gifts haven't changed since you left your private practice. You still have those unique gifts and talents. You're just using those maybe on a different branch. So my gifts and talents of curiosity and asking questions and advocating for people and just getting to the bottom of the issue, those worked great and served me well in the broadcasting space, but they're also serving me well as an entrepreneur and founder and advocate for working moms. And so God really just revealed that he's going to call us to different things in different seasons. And that gave me permission to, A, not tie my worth or worth to my work, or my, you know, my my calling to just my career um, or my value with my vocation. So I no longer tie any of that to the doing, right? So it's for me, it's almost an act of obedience. I know in this season, God has called me to really champion motherhood and working moms and families, and I'm going to do that with all my heart. He may call me to something different. So I just say, give yourself permission to try new things in new seasons. Your value is not your vocation. Um, look at your life as chapters and seasons instead of I got to figure it all out. I got to figure out the next 20 years. No, what is what are you being called to in this season? And sometimes it's the sometimes it's just the obedience. We have to go for what we're called. And it might not be the end game like, oh, this was a successful business that I was being called to. Or maybe it was a failure. Often it's just the active obedience. I'm following this call. And You'll know when you're being called to something, you know, you'll feel that peace. You'll also feel the fear (laughs) like, you know, I'm scared to go for it, but I have a peace that I'm supposed to go for it. But you'll always be using your gifts and talents. Um, Those won't change. But the way you go about um, using those gifts and talents will change in each season and in each chapter that you're called to. That's so good. So earlier, actually, you you answered a question that I that I ask a lot of people on here, but I want to ask it in a little bit of a different way. Yes. What's one of the best pieces of advice you've ever received that that really changed your trajectory after you got that piece of advice? You just really saw a shift in your life. Um. Well, I you know I mentioned earlier the advice that I got about mothering and parenting about you know just being able to drop a ball and dropping the perfectionism. Yep. Um, that was great advice. Um, I, I also think. Um, this might sound a little trite too, but some of the best advice I that I got, I felt like was God inspired <laughs> through a season yeah. of of um, insecurity. I, you know, when I had graduated from college, I had gone to school for broadcast communications, but I and my professors and and my peers were encouraging me to pursue an on camera career, but I was so insecure, I I felt unqualified. And um, I didn't want to put myself out there because I didn't want to look like a fool, right? It's that fear of failure. And it, this, so I was working in Columbus, Ohio, selling radio. I was working at Sunny 95. So I did a lot of weird things. I'd worked in video production. I worked at Arby's. I was cleaning apartments. I was just like hustling, trying to figure out what I wanted to do after college. 
And I got a job in radio sales. I was making great money. I was young. Um, in my mid-20s, I had just gotten married. And then 9-11 happened. And it was in that moment where I finally felt like I was glued to the coverage, this this horrific, unthinkable tragedy, and yet the storytelling and how our country banded together. And I finally felt like God say to me in that moment, okay, when I call you, I'll equip you. And that dream that everyone else had for you, you know, I finally mm. felt like I accepted that dream for myself. I had to push through my security, my insecurity rather. And so I quit my job. It was a lucrative radio sales job. And I just handed my resume out. I mean, I did, I was like um, substitute teaching in the process, you know, just to like pay some bills, but handed my resume out, got a PA job in Dayton, Ohio at KEF, WKEF and WRGT making seven bucks an hour. And um, I just really, really clung to that verse. I felt like God, it, and it's kind of been my vocational verse for the last, gosh, 25 years, which is jo Joshua 1, nine. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. And that just gave me a lot of, it gave me the courage I didn't have to press into my fear because A, we're commanded to, you know, have I not commanded you um, to be strong and courageous. And it also validated that I was going to feel scared and I was going to feel discouraged because it says, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. Like God's not commanding us to not feel that way if we aren't feeling that way. And then God promised that he would be there on the other side of it. And so I, I know that might sound a little weird, but that is the best. I, I feel like that's the best vocational, um, the best vocational advice slash mantra slash like foundational principle that I have, mm. that I've clung to the last 25 years of my life is, have I not commanded you to be strong and be courageous? Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged because God will be there in it, through it, at the end of it. And we often have to push into our, we almost always have to push into our fear. It doesn't go away. But I learned to reconcile peace and a fear at the same time that I can have a peace about going for something. You mentioned earlier about being called to something. I can have a peace about it, but I can still be scared as hell about it, you know? Yep, and those yep. often, those are never, I've learned they're not mutually exclusive. Like they're almost always go hand in hand. And so um, I've clung to that for the last 25 years and it has served me well. Uh, I think it's beautiful and pow powerful uh, advice from from the Lord to you. And I think that, um, yeah, you know, I, I think that there's this conception around maybe it's this is societal uh, or cultural today that, um, you know, you don't choose your virtue or your or or even certain feelings they choose you mm -hmm. in terms of hey i'm either courageous or i'm not or i'm either strong or weak or i'm you know but god is commanding you to like like be happy it's like be joyful well i'm either joyful or not if i had something bad happen to me versus no i'm, I'm going to choose to be joyful whether something good or bad happens today so i think part of what, what i also walked away there with is this like from that verse is there's a level of ownership here god saying be strong and courageous move forward whether you feel fearful or peace or whatever totally. it is and and I, I love that what what is your uh last question what is your best piece of advice for anybody you've you've shared i mean you've got a lot of great downloads <laughs> uh from people what's your best advice for and specifically that group right now that i know that you are looking to nurture and add value to and 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 help excel those those moms out there yeah i would just tell moms out there i would first of all encourage them to know their worth and um, don't let society tell you that you're a risk and a liability. Um, know that you have grown and be empowered that you have grown, whether the baby grew in your heart or your tummy, that you've grown in so many core capabilities, efficiency, empathy, courage, vision, leadership in because of motherhood, not in spite of it. Don't let anyone ever penalize you or scrutinize you because you're a mother, because you have grown in so many different areas. And I would just say, don't try to carry it all. Just just don't. It's not going to be good for you. You do not have to be perfect. Um, and surround yourself with a community, surround yourself with a village that you can be real with. But it all starts with you in owning that and knowing I don't, I can drop the perfectionism. I can ask for help. And I think if you do that, if you decide to that you're not going to carry it all, you're going to find your people, you're going to find a village, 
it, I think it's going to change the game for you. Um, I, I know it's allowed me to kind of ditch the guilt, <laughs> the mom, all the mom guilt to find a better way forward, um, really find these rhythms um, in working and mothering. Um, but it starts with us asking for help, finding our community and deciding that we're not going to carry it all anymore. I love it. It's great advice. Great advice. Thank you. I want to encourage everybody to check out Paula's. She's got a new children's book, right? You got a new ch yes. children's book out. It's called yes. Who? Yeah, yeah. Hold it's, that up here for everybody watching on YouTube. Yes. Uh, who do you want to be when you grow up? And I love this yes. because I can even tell from the title this is tied to <laughs> I identity. Yes. Uh, can as you well see? For kids. She's the little girl. The main character is drawing it, and she has covered over the what and the do with who and be because so often kids are asked. And we're asked as adults, what do you want to do? So this is who do you want to be? And it traces a little girl's journey. Her name is Lina. It's career day at school. She's stressed out because she's like, I don't know what I want. You know, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. And she learns along the way that the kind of person she wants to be, who she was created to be, her talents and gifts are much more important than what she's going to do because what she's going to do is going to change. But who she was uniquely created to be won't. I love that. I'm going to get that for for, for our, our three and a half year old Arwen. She'll love it. All of our all of my author proceeds go to the Boys and Girls Club in perpetuity. I'm a trustee. I believe again, it's like our kids are are wow. they our future or aren't yeah. they? And so I've been involved with the Boys and Girls Clubs for about ten years, and um, I wanted to donate all my proceeds to the BGCA in perpetuity for this book. I love that. Another good reason, and you can find this book uh, anywhere on Amazon. Yep. Anywhere, <laughs> bookstores nationwide, go to amazon.com, just search Paula Ferris. And who do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, Paula has a new podcast. Uh, it's called The Paula Ferris Show. So it should yeah. be easy to find Super there. Super original there. <laughs> yeah. Well, Super it's, uh, Yeah. Well, it's, you know, I'm. I did two other podcasts. I did one at ABC called Journeys of Faith, and I did one called Faith and Calling um, until March of this year. And this one's different. It's it's available on YouTube um, and anywhere you listen. But um, it's more it's a more mainstream, inspirational, like re we're, we're having conversations about real life, love, life, loss, all of it, um, keeping it real. Um, but we've had wonderful conversations with Whoopi Goldberg and comedian Trey Kennedy and Jesse Palmer from The Bachelor and um, Jenna Kutcher, who's a mom of two, an entrepreneur with the number one yep. marketing podcast. So just having real, honest conversations with them, um, you know, about life, keeping it real. So I love to ask questions. And um, the conversations have been really, really great and helping people live their best life. So that's what I want to do is encourage people to help them, help them live their best life. It's so great. Well, I love what you've been doing to help moms carry the load and uh, or, or help lighten the load for them. And I just, uh, yeah, I love the mission and I want to say thanks so much for coming on. It's been a joy, Thank even you. though I know you're a Michigan fan, I've, I've, I've enjoyed, blue. Uh, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the conversation um, oh, so much. Thank you. I great. appreciate it. It's been really great. And um, we'll see what happens that last Saturday of the regular season between Michigan and Ohio State. So we will. May the best team win. I'm excited. You know, it's, <laughs> both teams are great again, so it's a lot of fun. So It is really fun. Thank you, Dr. Cool. Josh. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much, Paula. Well, again, hey, thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the Growth Lab Podcast, where each and every week we cover the science behind how to grow. And hey, if you're watching on YouTube, please let me know, what is your biggest takeaway from the wisdom that Paula shared with us today? We'd love to hear, again, any of your feedback, any of your take. And if there is a gem of wisdom, I know that I had a lot. We'd love to hear from you as on that as well. And if you're not subscribed, hey, make sure to subscribe to the podcast. We got a lot more great interviews coming out here soon. And thanks again, to our special guest, Paula Ferris. Be blessed, everybody. Hey, if you like this interview, click here to watch my interview with my friend Sean Johnson East, where we discuss what it means to find your passion and purpose in life.